as your viewers might might have already heard, Japan recently has begun their discharge plan of the tritiated water from Fukushima. And this has stoked a lot of fear, I would say, and misinformation. I say a, a particular that that misinformation mostly is coming from China and they're putting out a lot of propaganda out there about it as well. But I think a lot of people misunderstand what's going on there. Like I said, people don't understand radiation. And my plan, and I've had this plan for quite a while, and I finally put it out, I think, at just the right moment when Fukushima decided to do their discharge. I'm like, hey, I am going to go to Fukushima. I'm going to eat the food. I am going to eat the fish. I'm going to swim in the water that's next, as close as I can get to where they're discharging. I will swim in the water. And not only am am I going to do that, I'm going to bring my kids with me. I'm going to have them consume those same foods that I'm consuming, get as close as they can and swim in the water. And even I'm not sure whether or not we can, but I would love to actually go into the exclusion zone as well and, and walk around and just show people that I, I really mean what I what I mean when it comes to the safety around Fukushima. And so I started to GoFundMe and it's on my my bio in TikTok. I should probably put it somewhere on, on Twitter, but it's one of my tweets. I put out a GoFundMe to support my trip to Fukushima to, to do this because I again, I'm not paid to to do this. So I need some help. So it's. I think if you look on GoFundMe, it's like uh, send the rad guy to Fukushima. <laughs> yep, go, it is GoFundMe.com slash F slash send the rad guy to. to Fukushima. Just because the facts are A, if the narrative is B and everyone believes the narrative, then B is what matters. But it's our job in our industry to speak up proudly, soberly, and to engage people in this dialogue. Those two and a half billion people that are in energy poverty, they need us. America cannot meet this threat alone. If there is a single country. Of course, the world cannot meet it without America. That is willing to. We're gonna need you, the next generation, to finish the job. Overhaul nuclear regulation. We need scientists to design new fuels. To focus on net public benefits. We need engineers to invent new technologies. Over absurd levels of radiation. Entrepreneurs to sell those technologies. Then we will march towards this. We need workers to operate assembly lines that hum with high tech zero carbon components. We have unlimited prosperity for all of you. Diplomats and businessmen and women and Peace Corps volunteers to help developing nations skip past the dirty phase of development and transition to sustainable sources of energy. In other words, we need you. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Fire Division podcast, where we talk about energy-dense fuels and how they could better human lives. I'm joined today by DJ LeClear, a health physicist, but also known as the Rad Guy. DJ, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. It's a Friday night. I'm ready to to relax for the weekend. But yeah, it was a long day. He's got potentially kids in the background and he's just like, it's Friday afternoon. So I'm I'm sitting on a patio also and trying to enjoy the last days of summer. Um, DJ, I'm stoked to talk to you. You're, You're well known on Twitter and the interwebs. Am I incorrect in stating that? I mean, yeah, I think I have a decent following on uh, on Twitter. I think majority of my following would be on TikTok, but I at least have an order of magnitude more followers on TikTok than I do on 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 Twitter. Why? Why is that? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a big question right there, right? Like, uh, <laughs> it's a little unfair. <laughs> we have to do so. <laughs> I mean, I, I love being on TikTok. TikTok really allowed me to grow a following very quickly. Like it was, it was insane. The number of followers I got just like within the first few weeks, people just interested in, in following me. And it takes significantly more effort to get more fo- or to get followers on, on Twitter and other, at least for me personally. <laughs> and I, I, I can't answer to why TikTok has been so more successful for me. I mean, I'm specifically putting out TikTok content, video content made on TikTok. So I can imagine on other platforms, I'm not getting as many followers because 
I'm trying to take TikTok content and shove it onto other platforms. So that's probably probably why. But gotcha. And your background, health physicist. What what does a health physicist? Yeah, I think whenever I tell people that I'm a health physicist, I usually tell them I'm a radiation health physicist because I don't think people really understand what health physicist means. At least I didn't until it took me quite a while to to understand what that means. But basically, even, even while you're studying it, right? You're like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But basically, it's protecting people in the environment from the effects of radiation, while at the same time, utilizing the benef- the benefits of radiation. So it's kind of doing doing both, finding ways to, to, to use radiation to save lives, while at the same time, making sure people are protected. And did you know that that's what you always wanted to do? Or how, how did you find that field? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> so I found the field actually from the Navy. I was a operator in on an aircraft carrier in the Navy as a Navy nuke. And I was a engineering laboratory technician. So I did radiation protection was, was what I did and took chemistry samples of the reactor and the steam plant and basically i was introduced because i got went into the navy and they're like hey you should be a nuke because you scored high and i'm like okay i'll I'll do that i'm just trying to get my college paid for you know ended up doing nuclear operations on on the carrier and ended up really loving it you know like I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get my degree in this. I, I was originally gonna do chemical engineering, but decided, you know what? I'm already getting a foundation in nuclear science. Might as well just keep keep it going. So I ended up getting my my undergrad in nuclear engineering technology, and then when I got out of the Navy, I didn't know what a health physicist was. Like I remember looking for jobs and seeing things for like health physicists and like. I guess maybe that's what I do. I I think I do health physics. At at the time, really, I was more of a health physics technician in the Navy. A health physicist usually is either like certified or has a degree specifically in health physics. So when I got out, I didn't have either of those things. But it wasn't until like when I got out, I did work on some x-ray machines wasn't really doing health physics, was doing more like mechanical, electrical troubleshooting, basically. And I did that for like five years. And it wasn't bad. I I enjoyed it. Uh, A lot of customer support, field support. But I was really itching to get back into more nuclear stuff. So I ended up getting a job with the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. They were hiring nuclear engineers. I was like, I'll do this. Like, that sounds really cool to me. Why the heck would a state be hiring nuclear engineers? I thought that was weird, but ended up doing, what's it called? I was, I worked for the radiation protection section in Wisconsin Department of Health Services. And specifically, I was doing radiological emergency response, where I would plan for emergencies involving the nuclear plants that we have in the state of Wisconsin. And I would also respond to any sort of radiological emergencies around the state, which was really cool. That's where I really started becoming a health physicist. It was, it was, it was an interesting role because I had to both use nuclear engineering understanding, like how a nuclear plant works as well as health physicists or health physics. So I was able to use that undergrad, got my graduate degree while I was working for Department of Health Services. And I was able to kind of bridge both of those subjects, which I think is a really advantageous thing to have, to be able to understand nuclear engineering while at the same time understand health physics. So worked there for six years, really enjoyed that. But I was ready to, for one thing, get paid a little better, I think, because being a state worker, you don't really get paid that that great. But and then I also was looking to 
utilize my degree a little more, right? So my job for the most part in radiological emergency preparedness was working with others, or like coordinating with counties, the feds, local hazmat teams, which I enjoyed, but it was only maybe 10% health physics and, and nuclear engineering, right? I was looking to get more, utilize way more of my understanding of health physics. And so I ended up actually switching jobs at the beginning of this year and actually April to Shine Technologies. And they're actually a fusion company and a, a medical is isotope production company, which is really cool. We can talk about that more if you want, but Again, or I, I mention this all the time as I, I don't represent my I don't represent my employer, my words are my own. Um, but in this job, I am absolutely <laughs> using my my health physics way more. So now it's more like 90 percent utilizing health physics, maybe sprinkled in with a little bit of nuclear engineering in there as well as all the other stuff. But yeah, it's. That's how I got into it. That's my whole life story there for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. It's It demonstrates, well, I was being pragmatic and I want to get my school paid for and then figure out, hey, here's a topic that I really enjoy. And, you know, I'm going to use, try and go make a living doing it. And you found a job and a career and then re recognize that, like, you aren't getting enough. And, I mean, I think that's a compelling story to tell the young professionals about how to go and live their life, right? Or even old professionals. Right? Yeah. Just, that's really cool. So that the health physics side, let's, I mean, I wanted to have you on to chat about radiation and dose. You got a lot of content in, mm -hmm. out in the public space. So I, I totally understand your, your words are not your employees, right? So I'll make that about yeah. that. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, but why don't you give us just kind of like a high level overview of radiation dose harm for help, help people understand. I know you've given this spe speech a lot. And I think you've, maybe even give it on a couple other podcasts, but for the benefit of folks that haven't heard it before. Sure. I mean, I mean, that's a, that's a very broad topic too. And I think there's a lot to be vague question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to discuss there. I think from a basic level, it is quite misunderstood as you probably know, when it comes to radiation and the word nuclear, right? Usually when people hear a radiation hazard or a nuclear hazard, they think it's going to be the worst. Like it's, they'll, they'll put it at the very top there, right? I, when I did my training with hazmat teams, I mean, they honestly, most of them already knew this, but you, I, I would lay out like all the different hazards out there, right? Radiological, chemical, biological. And I'd ask them like, which one would you say is the most hazardous? You come on an incident and you see you, which, which of these symbols, I show them the symbols, which of them is going to tell you that this is going to be a bad day, you know, which one's going to be the highest hazard for you that you are going to fear for your life. And typically a, a well informed hazmat team member, they'll say they'll take a radiation hazard any day, really, right? Because when it comes to the hazard, chemical hazards, I mean, those will kill you like that like right away, you know, biological, that's, that's, well, it'll kill you later type of thing, but still in the medium term will definitely be very harmful and can spread, right? Radiological, as long as you have the right detection capability, it's actually really easy to deal with. And even if you didn't have the, the proper radiation detection equipment, if you're coming upon a traffic accident, let's say that has a radiological component to it, like they're they're transporting radioactive material, we actually teach all of our hazmat team members to deal with all other hazards and life saving before you even think about like dealing with the radiation stuff. Like make sure everybody's safe, make sure there's no chemicals that are spilling off into place, like then go take radiation measurements. And that's actually spelled out in the books that the Department of Transportation hands out to hazmat team members on what to do when they see the different symbols, you know, on the, the placards, on the different shipping containers. That's what it says, like almost word for word in those books 
on what to do. So uh, I guess that's from a very basic level when it comes to which one's going to be the worst. Told the NRC that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're they're well aware too. That might surprise you. In my last job, what's that? I, I said I was being facetious. Yeah, they're well yeah. aware. But yeah. Mm -hmm. In my last job, I I worked with the with the NRC quite quite closely. You know, I worked with them a lot. I wasn't being regulated by them at all. They were actually a partner when it comes to radiological emergency preparedness. They are there to serve us, which is really great. I think now that I'm no longer in that role, now the NRC is more of a like, hey, we're your regulator now. Like, so it's a, it's a different role, but. I mean, I've had beers with NRC people and just like talk to them about all these different things and getting to hear, you, you know, their, their perspective and stuff. And it's very, it's very interesting. I won't, I won't rat anyone out, but it, I mean, it's, they have a very interesting perspective and, but uh, their role, they're very, very hyper-focused on radiological hazards, right? Like it's not in their purview to try to think of, say, I've, I've even asked them this question, like think about climate change and, and particulate emissions from coal plants. You know, they don't, they don't think about doing or comparing nuclear to those different hazards when they're making their recommendations or doing regulations. So yeah, that's, that's unfortunate that that's the way they roll. And I really, I really wish that that would change and it, it can change. I mean, Congress is the one that's in charge of the NRC. So if Congress decides that that is going to be part of their role. It will be. So, yeah. I like it. Okay. So circling back to just radiation, I mean, there's a dose and then a uh, rate of dose and there's rays mm -hmm. and becquerels and uh, different measurements and units. I mean, to simplify this a little bit for us. Maybe use analogies. I mean, if you mm -hmm. were to spell this out like with a crayon, make it easy for me. Oh, boy. So you want a little master class on radiation? Is yeah, a that... little master class. <laughs> not, as deep, not as deep as Mark Nelson, but a little yeah. master class. <laughs> yeah, I think... Yeah. <laughs> so, I know, I was just listening to a to a decouple podcast, it's, geothermal. It's geothermal one. Yep, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, they got it mostly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it made me really excited to look into it. But yeah, anyways, where was I going with it? Oh yeah, so I guess some some basics of radiation. Radiation is essentially it's energy, and when you are exposed to radiation. It's, it's the measure of the amount of energy that's deposited in your cells. Like that's, that's really as, as, basic, as basic as it gets there. And I guess a way to think about it is we have different types of radiation, right? So we have alpha radiation, beta radiation, gamma, x-ray. I could mention probably five more and I'll probably just confuse everybody, but the basic part of it is the energy of it. And some of the radiation, it's just purely energy. So you're thinking X-rays, gamma rays, that's electromagnetic radiation. It's, it's purely energy. And then there's other radiation, which is particles, but those particles have energy and it's the energy of those particles, which is sort of the hazardous part of it, right? So an example there is an alpha ray or an alpha particle that, or that is a particle radiation. And when that particle, that alpha particle has no energy, so basically it's just kind of floating around, it's simply helium. That's all it is, you know, and helium is one of those things that, you know, we, we inhale into our lungs, you know, and, and talk funny. But if you give that helium a lot of energy, it can do harm, at least internally. So that, that is that that is the basic part of it is that energy. So that that causes it to be a hazard. And if if you want me to, I can get into kind of 
how that energy is hazardous at a cellular level that affects, you know, the human. Is that, is that what you want yeah, me to, let's do it. yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. 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 So I think um, a lot of people like miss it you know, the, 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 what we're trying to protect against. And I guess the, my end goal is people are terrified of radiation. They're, they're scared of nuclear because radiation exists and I radionuclides, mm -hmm. which is just the materials that come out of a nuclear accident have radiation and the reactor creates radiation, but like, how does that act? How would that actually get into the environment? And like, what's the actual mechanism that this could happen? Yeah. So I think a key thing there, uh, so we'll, we'll hold off on the whole energy departed on, on cells, right? I'm going to, we're going to put a pause on that and, and talk about one other misunderstanding that I think is good to clear up uh, before moving on a little deeper into that. But the difference between radiation and radioactive material or contamination. Radioactive material and contamination are pretty much exactly the same thing. It's just contamination is where you don't want it. Radioactive material is a more generic form. You know, you, you can have radioactive material that is somewhere where you want it or you don't want it. And when you, it's where you don't want it, it's called contamination. So radioactive material, those are, that can be really any sort of element hydrogen all the way up to uranium and, and into beyond uranium, right? When it comes to size, it can be any of those different elements. And it is specifically unstable forms of elements. So an example is tritium. Tritium is an unstable form of hydrogen and it has too many neutrons in it. So it wants to get to a stable state and it will emit radiation and then go into a more stable form. It will actually go into helium. So when you say something is leaking radiation, that doesn't really make any sense because radiation, remember, that's the energy coming off of it. So you're not really, you don't leak energy. There's very specific instances where that would happen, but not, not in the, the sense that people are usually talking about. They're like, oh, there's a radiation leak from a nuclear plant, right? No, a radioactive material or contamination leak. And that is the element or the isotope that is unstable, that is leaking itself. And then the radiation, again, that is that energy or those, those particles with energy that are coming off of the radioactive material. So I think that's a, that's a key thing to know when, when, Whenever anybody is learning about radiation is the difference between those two things. And one of the ways that I, I like to describe it well, as the material that's released from a plant, mm -hmm. right? is like this dust of radioactive material contamination that is radioactive, radioactive yeah, has radiation, but like that's what gets into the environment that the NRC tries to protect. Against. Yep. Yeah, it's it's it is the material itself that is emitting the the radiation, and I like to think of it as like think coals of a fire, right? So the fires died down, you just have coals, right? The coals, you put your hands up to it, and you can feel the heat coming off. That heat is literally radiation, just infrared radiation, and so that heat you're feeling off of it is the radiation. And then the coals themselves are like the radioactive material, right? You can take that coal, you can put it somewhere else, and it'll start emitting radiation in that other place, right? You can feel the heat coming off of it, which is the radiation. That's the difference between radiation and contamination. Think of hot coals. A lot, some people like to say, I, I, I hate the analogy. I don't even know why I'm talking about it, but they, they think of it as like, poo <laughs> you can smell it which is like the radiation but the poo itself is the the contamination or the radioactive material i don't really like that one i like the coals you can yeah that's that's kind of a shitty example <laughs> <laughs> yes very very well done there a uh, uh, little bit of comedic relief there but anyways i think that, that, that that's a good distinction there so talked about difference between contamination and radiation. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and again, get into more of at the cellular level, which affects people um, at a organism level or a human level, right? So just like how getting hit with a punch or getting hit with a bullet or getting hit with a 
baseball is going to harm you. Same thing when the radiation comes out of the radioactive material and hits your cells. But it's going to, the, the, the damage that's done is not at a very large level. It's a very uh, molecular level, right? So it's going to actually harm your DNA in your cells, right? And it's going to cause DNA breaks, either by directly hitting your DNA, which doesn't happen very often, or it's going to actually hit the water in your cells. And it causes those that water to create what's called free radicals. And I know I'm getting really in depth here, but it's for a reason. It's, it causes free radicals in, in your cells, right? And those free radicals will then go on to uh, harm your DNA. So kind of those two different ways, either directly hitting your DNA or creating those free radicals, which will then go and, and harm your, your DNA. And one of the things that's really important to understand when it comes to DNA damage and DNA breaks is DNA breaks happen in every single cell thousands of times a day, thousands of times a day. And, and it's not the radiation for the most part, like radiation only makes up a really tiny, tiny portion of those DNA breaks. The vast majority of it is just from your body's metabolism and, and breathing oxygen. So those type of things will create those free radicals again inside your cells, which then can cause the DNA breaks. And because of this, your body is extremely good at repairing those DNA breaks. So radiation only, it doesn't cause anything unique inside of your body when it comes to DNA breaks, because like I said, that's just a common thing. All of our cells it happens thousands of times every single day. So radiation basically just kind of amplifies those DNA breaks, adds more to those DNA breaks. And the amount that it increases your DNA breaks is actually a lot smaller than people think. It's, it's, it's again, it's very, very small amount. And that's why even if you get a very large dose of radiation, say, I'm going to start speak, speaking some, some terminology here that might not make sense to people, but REM is usually what we talk about or sieverts. So a hundred millisieverts, which is equivalent to 10 REM, even at that level, which is a lot of radiation to the body, it still only accounts for a very small portion of those DNA breaks in your body. But it does cause in a large population of people a statistically significant increase of those DNA breaks in the body that can cause a statistically significant increase in your chances or the chances of that population of getting cancer. And because, again, your body has those DNA breaks going on every single day, your chances of getting cancer just from a baseline, no radiation at all, are like 40%. I think that surprises people when they hear that statistic. But it is a reality. And it's the reason why I'm actually working for Shine now, because Shine, one of their things is cancer fighting radionuclides. But yeah, so because your body has those DNA breaks happening all the time anyways, and there's misrepair going on inside your body, your chances of getting cancer are already up here. And re adding radiation to it just barely moves the needle at all to where you have to get a very significant amount of radiation to even barely move that needle. You could even get, honestly... A, a dose of radiation that could almost kill you in the short term, which I can talk about that after I'm done talking about this cancer part, you can get it. Maybe it doesn't kill you. You just get radiation sickness and you, you get treatment and then you survive your chances of getting cancer still only move uh, from that 40%, maybe to like 44%. So, which is statistically significant in a large population and Nobody wants to increase their chances of getting cancer. So you would have rather not <laughs> got that 4% extra. But if you think about it, 4% added to 40, I mean, it's not a huge increase in getting in chances of getting cancer. And it's really 
good to remember that because a lot of people think like, oh, wait, I got exposed to radiation at these low levels and I got cancer. Or I live next to Three Mile Island and I got cancer. And they, and I think it is natural for us at, as humans to want to attribute something to what is hurting us. We want to attribute something to that cancer because we do not like the idea of something just kind of randomly happening to us and harming us. And that that is so throughout our our culture and our our human psyche that we want to attribute it to this thing that happened to us or this company here. They're the ones that gave me the cancer. And even if it would only make up a very tiny percentage of that increase of your already existing one to where you couldn't even tell whether or not it was that outside thing or not, because your chances of getting it anyways was already very high. So yeah. Any questions on that? Yeah. <laughs> questions class. <laughs> I love it. I'll say it back real quick. We we're pretty sure that DNA strand breaks are, they cause cancer. They happen naturally. Uh, if you get blasted with radiation, there's a good chance that more of them will happen than happen in the background and your probability of getting cancer goes up. I think everyone agrees on that, where I think some of the industry disagrees is like at what level and how much and how much should we protect against, right? So there's, there's nuance, I'll say, to the lowest end of the protection necessary. Um, yeah. For the, for the dose piece. I mean, we mentioned REMS and Sieverts. Let's circle back on that a little because it drives me crazy. And I, even though I've been studying this stuff for a long time, like I still can't get it straight. And like the fact that yes. REMS is 10 of something, I mean, yeah, okay. Metric system is 10, but like it is kind of a nefarious conversion and they, you know, I guess, can, can we use bananas as a, as a metric? I, find, I do find the banana analogy helps a lot. So what, what do these things mean? Yeah. So, I mean, like I mentioned in the beginning, it's all about energy, right? Energy that's imparted on your body. And if you actually break down a sievert, which is how we measure radiation, at least from a international standpoint, it is actually joules per kilogram, which for those who understand joules, is just a measurement of energy. So it's basically all it is, is the measurement of the amount of energy per your body weight <laughs> that was imparted on it, right? So the, the amount of energy that was deposited per unit mass. And that really, again, just goes down to the, those basics of, of what radiation is. It's just energy deposited on your tissues. And I do want to get to some of that. What, what, what it means when it comes to, or the, in the industry, when it, some people think at lower doses, you, you have either no health effect or increased health effect or negative health effects. So you actually have uh, a better outcome. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit, but um, I think I want to, I want to, talk about some of the other effects that we know for a fact are uh, there is a threshold. So for those, for those lower doses of radiation when, or the cancer effects, the, the existence of a threshold that is widely debated of, of what, whether or not at below a certain dose, you won't see any health effects or you'll get better health. But when it comes to large doses of radiation in a very short period of time, so a lot of those joules per kilogram, maybe maybe we should just talk joules per kilogram. That that might actually just shut people down. But <laughs> for the physicists and engineers that listen, we'll get it because that's right? it's psi right? units, it's fundamental units, right? You break it down to the fundamentals. It's energy per unit mass. But yes. yeah, for everyone yeah. else, they're like, we don't know, man. Banana equivalent yeah. dose. We want BEDs. Give us those. How many bananas? Yeah. <laughs> The nice thing is at that one sievert or the that one joule per kilogram of, of radiation, that's about that threshold where we know that you will start seeing negative health effects um, in the short term. So 
acute effects is what we call that, or short-term effects. And that is what radiation sickness is. So we know for a fact at that one sievert, which is equivalent to 100 rem for my friends who are, which actually includes me because all of our regulation is built on rem, or I, actually not even that. Let me let me. Oh man, there's there's too many too many units because sieverts is is actually a little different. But I'm just gonna talk at sieverts, even though for for my health physicist, it's technically it's gray, but. We're just going to talk in yeah. sequence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the same, like <laughs> not quite. Not quite. So, Sieverts is helping equate those cancer effects. So, if you received one gray to the body of gamma radiation, that is equivalent to one Sievert of radiation, and. Then from there, after converting it to sievert, which is a one for one for gamma radiation, but it's different for other types of radiation, then you can start saying, okay, here's your increase in your chances of getting cancer. So that that's why we convert to sieverts. It helps us out with that. That's yeah. really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So usually when we're talking about those short term effects, you don't need to convert to sieverts. So we are talking in gray at that moment, which again is equivalent to the one joule per kilogram. So, but yeah, so at those high doses of radiation, those those one gray or those one sieverts, we know for a fact that you start getting radiation sickness. And from there, your severity of your radiation sickness goes up. So all the way to about 10 sieverts. And then at that point, you're probably going to die basically. And it gets severe, more and more severe as you go higher in that amount of radiation. And that is a ungodly amount of radiation. Like that is the first responders to Chernobyl, the people who were like staring into the reactor basically, or, or grabbing the, the graphite that wasn't there, you know? So th there's a very large dose of radiation and there Which, like, are as far as ha hazards in life are concerned, mm -hmm. it it would be so difficult to get exposed to that level of radiation. Like, I mean, this would be like the equivalent of like, I, I mean, I can't even think of a great example because it's just bizarre. It like, hey, how uh, how about you suddenly become exposed to seventeen missiles striking you, or <laughs> you know, being thro thrown into a lava pit? Like, yeah, that there's yeah. only a, a few man-made lava pits throughout the world, and they're all guarded heavily. Like, it, it's just irrational to think that people could ever be exposed to these levels as members of the public, right? Like, yeah, yep. And I think when people think about radiation, they're like, oh, shoot, I've been exposed to radiation. Their brain automatically goes to those worst case scenarios, right? Yeah, it's, it, which is silly, right? It's like, it, it's almost like, no, you put your hand next to the coals of a campfire. You didn't just douse yourself in gasoline and have seven torches thrown at you, right? Yeah. Like, that is, yeah. maybe that's my conclusion. <laughs> I think that's a good, I think that's a good one. Like, you didn't, like touched like a slightly hot surface that was kind of close to the fire and like, oh, that was kind of hot. Like you didn't just get third degree burns all around your body. Like that's the difference there. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Or feeling just the slight warmth, like, oh shoot, now I'm going to get third degree burns. Like, no, <laughs> you you didn't just dive into the fire. <laughs> so yeah, that that is the difference there. So I just want to talk about that one when it comes to the effects is usually when people are talking about, you know, masterclass talking about the effects of radiation, they definitely talk about those, those short-term effects and that th those ones we like know what the LD 50 is. So like the, the dose of radiation that people would get that uh, they have a 50, 50 chance of dying. Basically it's like around 400, 400 and yeah, 400, 450, something, something like that is the range where it's like you have a 50-50 chance without any medical care. And then if you do get medical care, it goes up by another 100 rad, or I should say, I said 450. I'm, see, I'm, I'm confusing everyone with units here. <laughs> I should say four and a half sieverts or gray or sieverts is that 
50 50 threshold and then it goes up to like five and a half if you if you get medical care so which we've gotten we don't have a lot of doctors that are too experienced at it but there's definitely people who are who know how to take care of people who have been exposed to a large dose of radiation so i guess one of the things we can talk about a little bit of transition in here do you want to talk about that controversy the the uh, linear no threshold hypothesis you want to well let's preface it because yeah. when you look at why nuclear is hard to build mm -hmm. uh, people will often point to the nuclear regulatory commission and say well it's too hard to permit and I, I mean, they, they are protecting against people being exposed to radiation and they will certify designs that are then set in stone and you literally have to get those rules changed as like an act of Congress, basically, to, to be able to make changes to those designs, which is not how engineering work. It's not, it's not how innovation works. And so something that really frustrates me is like, why are these rules so strict? And if you go and read the regs and talk to the people at the commission and trace it back it goes back to this principle of well any amount of radiation is horrible and it, it will kill you um and in, in my opinion they're drastically overprotecting and they would say well no there so there's some controversy and debate there so um yeah and i, I think there's 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 controversy and debate on whether or not that is in fact the reason why it's not going anywhere and sure. yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think that there, there's absolutely a, a argument to be made in that direction because yeah, you're, you're right. Like we, we just had, what's it called? Oklo Re recently, they had their application just denied. Like, and I was actually in talking to them at that time when it, when it happened and it, it actually caught them off guard and it's like, really? And we're, we're proving all of these other things out there that are way more hazardous and harmful. So a absolutely. I think, I think that we have made it unnecessarily difficult to license a plant and approve a design. And that that's very unfortunate I mean, at the same time, there is a high level of safety that we have been able to maintain. And then there is then on the other, the flip side of the argument is like, now we've created this such high safety that we've created this illusion that it's because it's more hazardous when in fact it's not right. Like we've created the illusion that radioactive material being transported is super hazardous compared to transporting what's it called ammonia, right? And ammonia truck, you can crash an ammonia truck and you can kill a bunch of people really easily. And it just doesn't have nearly the amount of regulations, but people, again, they fear that that radioactive symbol that that hazard a lot more than the, the, I think it's corrosive symbol for ammonia. And we've, we've just made it super costly compared to what the hazard actually is. So, I mean, I'm proud to be somebody who is a radiation protection people person that is going through and making sure I'm following all the regulations and everything. But yeah, at, at the same time, I really feel personally, I feel like the rest of the uh, hazardous materials industry needs to at least come up to our level. Maybe, maybe not all the way to our level. Cause then honestly it would shut everything down, but maybe they yeah. need to come up a little. Yeah, nothing would get done. What's that? I was saying nothing would get done, but yeah. You're right. It's You're right. Equalization. I think there needs to be a little bit of equalization. And even I like to argue with myself, like this is, this is, I haven't even formed a very good argument because within my own thoughts, because I don't believe that we should no longer fly or no longer drive cars. Those all come with very high risk. Well, not flying, but compared to a, a nuclear plant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, flight is more dangerous than, than, than running nuclear plants. And I think on the flip side of the argument, 
we need to understand risk versus benefits, right? And we know that there's a benefit to driving your car. We know there's a benefit to flying. And there's absolutely a benefit to running a nuclear plant and using nu nuclear materials. And I think we need to have a better cost-benefit analysis, right, on that. And I think that is something that we're lacking a lot in the regulatory sphere and just within my own industry, right? We need to we need to do better at at understanding that. Yeah. And that does kind of transition a little bit into LNT, I think. Okay. And well yeah, let's let's talk about it. LNT. Linear yeah. no threat. Right? Yes. That's, that's dominating I mean, this is the idea that any dose is harmful and cumulative dose is uh, impactful. I mean, the total dose received over time um, yeah. is just as harmful as receiving it all at once, which I think there's some debate around that topic. But yeah, what what is LNT and why do people think this exists? So LNT, linear no threshold, this is talking about those cancer effects, right? And this is not talking about the short-term effects from getting an ungodly amount of radiation. Those we know very well have a threshold to it. Well, and, and those are linear, right? <laughs> and we know mostly from Chernobyl and from the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, right? right? That, like, that's where all the data comes from. And you look at the data, it's definitely a straight line. So... And those we're talking about, uh, th that, that linear kind of, I, I don't know if it's exactly linear, but basically the more radiation, the more severe those acute effects, those short-term effects are. When it comes to those low-dose effects, the cancer effects, it's more of a numbers game, right? So more radiation you get, the more likely you are going to get cancer. It doesn't mean it's going to be a really bad cancer just because you got more radiation. It just means you have statistically higher risks of getting cancer. And the linear no threshold, the, we know, like you said, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, from studying that population of people who got exposed to radiation at different levels of radiation, we know that those people who got those very high doses of radiation, we're talking about greater than 10 rem or 100 millisieverts. Those are both the equal uh, quantities of, of radiation dose. Greater than that, we see a linear increase of the chances of getting cancer. And here's a, here's a controversial take. Uh, for you here. But I think a lot of people think that chemical hazards, we they, they don't treat that as being linear no threshold. They do, actually. When it comes to any sort of hazard, and it, it might have came actually from our, our studies of, of the, the health effects and cancer effects of, of radiation. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but because radiation is very, very well studied. Other hazards that have long-term cancer effects, they, they actually do attribute a linear no threshold hypothesis to those as well. So say alcohol, like you've probably heard it in the news recently, they say no level of alcohol is, is safe. I, I hate that term. And I'll talk about that. Remind me to talk about that term. But basically, no matter how low of, of level of alcohol you've had, it's going to cause a increase in your your chances of having a health effect right long term down the road so we do see that in other industries so i'm just gonna that's a controversial thing that i think i've heard people say incorrectly but we the other industries do believe in or have a linear no threshold type of thing to it but anyways what that is is they say okay linearly we see after 10 rem Going up and up and up and up, we see an increase of getting chances of getting cancer from those survivors, right? So let's, for a prudence and a, a simplicity of regulation, let's assume that any radiation you get um, is going to cause harm. And we follow that line at those high doses and we draw that line 
all the way to zero radiation dose. And we say any increase in that radiation dose from zero will cause a increase in your chances of getting cancer. And the reason why that is something that they think is the case, at least uh, the proponents of linear no threshold, is because, like I said, uh, and, uh, radiation is energy being deposited on your cells, causing those free radicals to be formed, causing damage to your DNA, right? And one little thing of radiation going in, causing one free radical, let's say, or one pair of free radicals, could have a chance of damaging your DNA, so therefore has a chance of causing cancer. So that's, and, and linearly up into whatever doses. That, that is what linear no threshold is. And the alternate to that is a threshold, right? Hypothesis or a, technically speaking, it's actually, it's all hormesis. If you don't think the threshold is true, you think hormesis is true. Because if you want a threshold, hormesis has to be true as well. Just uh, putting it out there. And I think people don't understand that. But this is a new term I'm, I'm mentioning now, hormesis right? That's an, that's the alternate, the anti uh, no threshold. They say, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, at these low doses, there is actually, uh, it is not linear. Um, and what's interesting is we've not really measured it very well at those low doses because it's very hard to measure at with, since we all 40 have that 40% chance of getting cancer anyways. So we're all arguing about something that's very hard to, <laughs> to see. And they say, no, at those low doses, it doesn't, it doesn't go linearly down to zero, your chances of getting cancer. It actually drops down, either down straight to zero, and then stays at zero at a certain level. That's called threshold, right? So basically, after a certain point, that line goes down to zero. And then after that, you have no increase in your, your chances of getting cancer. And then what people commonly referred to as being hormesis is it not only does it go down to zero, it drops down below zero. So you have a negative statistical chance of getting cancer, which means it in fact decreases your chance of getting cancer is what people commonly call hormesis. For either hormesis or threshold hypothesis to exist, you need to have a hermetic effect that that basically drops that statistical chance of getting cancer down below that that line to zero. There has to be some sort of benefit that comes out of it to counteract that increase or that that cancer chances of getting cancer basically. So that when it when it, the threshold theory is actually weak hormesis and then the other one would be just hormesis basically. Those are kind of the three different camps. And actually, there's another camp in there. And that is not only is it linear, it's not linear, actually, it's super linear. So at low doses, there's actually a higher, not not higher than the, the high doses, but like it doesn't go linearly down to zero. It actually has like kind of a hump. So it, it kind of like almost flattens out and then goes down to zero. So it goes above that line down to zero. So they say you, you don't even draw a line straight to zero. You actually have your, your chance. You, you have a greater risk to getting cancer than what linear no threshold says. So there's, there's proponents of that. And there's actually recent evidence that might point to that actually may be true. I still, I'm still evaluating that evidence myself, but yeah, th that's, that's the, ar the whole argument in there. Do you have any questions on those different kind of stances there. Did I did I clearly state that for you? It was it was very detailed. Like, mm -hmm. I guess the whole time when I was listening to it, it's like the one question that's screaming in my mind is why why does it matter? There you go. And I let, let's go back back to like 2017 for me, right? That's when I started really becoming a nuclear advocate because that's when I kind of had this epiphany, like, wait a minute, climate change is a big deal and we need to address it. And that's when I started becoming a, a nuclear advocate. And 
in the nuclear advocate community, there's a very strong group or uh, belief that linear no threshold is so wrong and it is evil. It is it is what's keeping nuclear from from being a being a thing, right? It's it's what's holding us down, right? And so there when back in 2017, I was like, yeah, this is stupid. Like I heard I, I heard some of the arguments about this this hermesis thing. Like I bet you hermesis is true, you know, like and I definitely was very on the anti LNT train, basically. 2017 all the way until about 2000 and I want to say 19 I think so a couple of years and and there was a lot of good arguments out there and on why LNT is just not a real thing and then I remember I virtually attended the health physics ANS symposium on low dose radiation listeners can can check on me if, if that was 2018 or 2019 but i remember coming out of that like going in right strong anti lnt and then coming out like not really having a good opinion either direction actually really understanding that at those low doses the amount of population that you would need to study in order to figure out whether or not there actually is a health effect to radiation is so large that it's just infeasible to to be able to do that. People kept during the symposium, like you would have to have a billion people that you were studying. I'm like, geez, which you just can't do it. It's just not possible. But I will say the thing that I got out of it was like, wait a minute, like why, why do we argue about this? When the reason why it's so difficult to study is because the health effects at those low doses is so incredibly low, even if it was linear, why do we care? <laughs> like, again, I talked about it before. Health or there, there's risk versus benefits. We all drive our car. We all know the, the chances of getting in a car accident and dying is actually pretty large, right? Yet we do it anyways because it has so much benefit. And even if LNT was true, the amount of benefit that we get from nuclear power, nuclear medicine, using radiation, using x-rays is so high. It, it just so dwarfs any risk that is there at all. And it kind of started getting me to like, I don't know if I even care about which which one's actually true anymore. Like it has no, I think a lot of nuclear advocates have tied their belief in anti-LNT so tightly to to their, their nuclear, their, their nuclear advocacy. Like they don't want to let go and just realize like it, it doesn't matter when it comes to what what really matters is our understanding to not treat the risk that comes from radiation differently than other risks i think that is the battle that we need to be to be really fighting the the belief that radiation and nuclear power and anything that comes any risks that come from that we we weight them higher than other risks that is the problem to me, but that's my that's my standing. On that's on it. Exactly well put, right? I, mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. I, I think why advocates get wrapped up in it is because, I mean, literally in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's in Title Ten CFR Title Ten, where all of these rules are written, and there's thousands mm -hmm. of pages of rules, like that the words as low as reasonably achievable are in place because of this principle. And that is then motivating the, the commission to make rules and prevent people from developing technologies and iterating on them and testing them and making them better and better because they think they're protecting, but they're irrationally protecting against this risk that is not that dangerous. I mean, yeah, you said, you said it very well. If you compare it on a net basis, a net benefit, that public benefit, then that it, it's not even close. Which I mean, that that's why we included part of that. A quote from an expert in the industry 
in our intro <laughs> that says if there's a country that can get over net public benefit or use net public benefit as a metric instead of ridiculous levels of radiation protection, then we'll have prosperity yeah. for everyone. So. Yeah. And I think you, you hit on something very important there, Alara, right? I, I remember after my kind of epiphany or maybe my moving to a different kind of stance, uh, I was thinking, I was like, wait a minute, this Alara thing, that's the issue, right? And then I was strongly on like Alara, that's the problem. And I'd like to take it even a, a step farther than that. I, I want to say our interpretation of Alara and our misquoting of Alara. If you look it up, ICRP, and I'm probably going to, I'm not, I'm not going to perfectly quote it. That's not the full sentence. It does not say we need to keep doses as low as reasonably achievable. It says we need to keep doses as low as, low as reasonably achievable, taking into account societal and economic, what are they, there's a different, there's a word they use, taking, taking those in, those things into account, right? We need to take those things, we need to take those benefits and those other things into account when we're trying to keep things as low as reasonably achievable. People don't finish the sentence. That's the problem. <laughs> Which um, then you could interpret that as, hey, look at the net public benefit, meaning it, the opportunity yes. cost. If you, if you eliminate the death from another form of energy, uh, yes. then immediately be using nuclear, if that was your metric, yes. because it's just so much safer. It doesn't, it doesn't kill anybody. Yeah. So I think the interpretation as, of as low as, excuse me, as low as reasonably achievable is really the big problem right there. We, we need to take economic and societal benefits and detriments into, into effect. And this, I, I feel like my current job, our radiation protection, like we do think about those things. We actually talk about it, which is a good thing. And I, I wish more industry, more people in the industry would think about, would talk about it is, is talk about, yeah, okay, we're going to cure this dose. But look at the benefit over here. But I think we really do need to look into making sure that we're doing that cost benefit analysis quite often. And this was talked about during that symposium again. We will reduce doses to a detriment because we're trying to fo follow this as low as reasonably achievable with, for one thing, our interpretation of reasonable is, is not great. We, we have sent people to the Morgan body bags trying to reduce a dose out in the desert that is going to have no effect on people type of thing. Like that, that was talked about during that symposium is where you will harm people trying to reduce a dose that would have caused much, much less harm. So we cause more harm than the harm that we were trying to reduce basically. And when I was working for the Department of Health Services in radiation protect, or sorry, radiological emergency preparedness, one of the things that we talked about was after a nuclear plant emergency happened, and maybe you did a shelter in place, or you did a temporary evacuation, which there's an argument on whether or not which one of those is going to be better and more beneficial. There is this idea that, okay, now we need to say, hey, you left home in an emergency for just like a, a temporary evacuation, but it turned out there was some radioactive material that was deposited on your home. And now we would, we would say, we don't want you to go back home. And the amount of detriment that comes from that is so high. I actually did my, my capstone project on this for my master's and the amount of detriment from radiation. So the harm from radiation that you were reducing versus the harm that you were doing from removing people from their homes, uh, it just did not make sense whatsoever. And all of that because we just have this belief that we need to reduce doses as low as reasonably achievable without t thinking about all those other things. So it, it has always been my recommendation that we do not move people from their homes in, in, except for the most extreme cases um, from nuclear plant emergencies like Fukushima, probably uh, evacuation, maybe permanent relocation from their homes. Not at all. It was not worth it per 
the math that I did and, and on my capstone project. I love it. All right, DJ, are you familiar with any of Jack yeah. Devaney's work with Gordy and not? I've, I've absolutely loved all of the content that he puts out. He's actually denied being on the podcast because, I mean, he's getting up there in years, but he's happy to let us, well, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I quote his work often, but I, I he has a metric or he's pointing to metric. Yeah, he probably wasn't the first one, actually, who has written some posts on it, but dollars spent per life year saved. Right. I think that kind of captures the idea that you're trying to articulate there, meaning any additional dollars spent on radiation protections aren't saving as many lives as we could be spending dollars on any other protection for other chemicals, more seatbelts, more education about drug use, right? Like uh, literally anything else that we could do has a better health impact on society yeah. than radiation protections. Would you agree? I, I like that. I've, I've, I've heard about that before. Yeah. So I, I wasn't familiar with the name, but that does sound familiar. And I, I, I've heard of attempts of, of doing sort of those sort of metrics. And I think it's not a bad idea. And it's kind of, it's, I feel like we should be talking to an economist because I feel like that that's what they do, right? When it comes to, hey, should I, spend my money on this 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 large project here when and then we discount it years into the future based off of oh what if i spent my money on this other project type of thing so yeah i i I do i do like that um approach okay well we're we're coming up on our time dj actually we've already gone over it we we want you for an hour and over that so um what what do you think is the most impactful step that folks can take to build more nuclear or maybe asked a different way, how, how can people help? Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the things, that, I mean, there's a lot of different things we could talk about and uh, there's a lot of opinions out there, right? Uh, some people are like, hey, we need to get on the SMR train, so small modular reactors, or no, we need to focus on large modular reactors. We need to just keep building those because those are more economical, right? And I think there's a lot of arguing on those 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 fronts right there. But I think I think it is there is something to say of like we shouldn't always be sh- uh, chasing the shiny thing. I think the going the boring way is just fine. Unfortunately, and I I really really feel like that is the way to go. So, yes, large modular reactors, while at the same time looking towards maybe small modular reactors. And I think a lot of people are, and a lot of, what's it called, the utilities are really like, hey, I can't afford to put all of my money into these multi-billion dollar projects. I'd rather do it on this less than a billion dollar project of an SMR. But I, I think a really important thing, and, and I think that's fine. I'm kind of contradicting myself, but I feel like we shouldn't be chasing the shiny things. I think we also think, oh, we just need to do molten salt reactors that's just, or thorium reactors. No, let's stick to boring. If we want to add in boring SMRs to that, as well as doing large modular reactors, I think that's really what we should be going for. And I don't think, I think what we need to make sure we're doing is, is sticking to those standardized designs that you've probably heard about. And I don't know if it's been talked about in here. And, and basically, we need to build our construction industry back up is really what we need to, to do is we need to learn again how to be a, a nation that can actually deliver on construction. So I know I wasn't very specific on that, but I, I really do think we need to focus on the basics yeah i i literally just talked to dj hansen the chief operating officer of uh, flybe energy so we'll have a good counterpoint to the don't build thorium reactors (laughs) i like which i think is fine in in tandem but i don't think that we should say no only build thorium we need to direct everything to thorium i think Thorium is just fine. Adding it to hey, our this is America, man, right? We can just we've got the freedom to go and build whatever the market wants, whatever yeah. we buy, right? So it's just like it's just like I, th- I hear a lot of people who tell me like, no, we don't need to be 
building nuclear. Nuclear had its day. We need to be focused on the wind and solar and batteries. We should be spe- we, money spent on nuclear is wasted. Like I feel like that's such a bad thing to be saying, right? Like saying money spent on thorium reactors is wasted. I think is a wrong thing to say as well. So, BJ, where where can people find you if they want to engage? Uh, Twitter and TikTok, but is it just at the Rad Guy? So on TikTok, it's the Rad Guy glows. Rag the Rad Guy was already taken, so <laughs> the Rad Guy was taken everywhere. So I, I everything was uh, on, on Twitter. It's actually I want to say it's stats Rad Guy. I'm spelling it in as I'm doing this. Five. <laughs> yes, it's at. That rad guy five. Yeah. <laughs> I should have chosen one. About this interaction. I mean, you, you post videos, you do inspirational stuff, right? educational stuff. Um, yeah. But what do you like about it? What do you get out of it? Are you saying out of this interaction that we're having right now? No, no, no. Out of uh, social media. I mean, uh, you could say, yeah, you could say, Mark, I don't know. It's been kind of boring talking to you. I feel like I've been talking to a kindergarten. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate this conversation because I usually when I go on podcasts and I think it's fine, I'm usually asked about like, hey, well, let's talk about your TikToks. Let's talk about uh, how to make videos and how to how to communicate on social media, which I enjoy talking about that. But this has been refreshing because I'm, I'm really going into some other subjects that I'm also passionate about, but I don't really get asked about that much. I think the last time I was asked about that was in my very first podcast with, it was on the Rational Radio. I don't know if you've heard, or no, not the Rational Radio, sorry, the Rational View. And it was right before I became the rad guy, really. It was like my, my hey, I'm going to start this. At the very end, we, they were like, hey, I'm going to start this YouTube channel, which ended up actually being a TikTok channel. But that that was my first time being brought on. And I did talk about kind of this subject that we're talking about now. But yeah, it was really refreshing to get into that that topic. And I enjoy talking about it a lot. And I, I get up on my 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 What's that called? Stool. I get on my pedestal or not pedestal. So so box. box. Thank you. Think of it as a stool, man. It's a box. <laughs> I get up on my 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 soap box and and, and t- talk about the whole like stop focusing on LNT. <laughs> That's my yeah. my soap box there. But that was I I really was very happy to to be able to get on that. And I yeah I I'm on social media. I don't really talk about that much. And I really, sh- I probably should talk about it much. I don't know if the general public is interested in hearing about my stances on LNT. The- like, oh yeah, <laughs> well, I'll make them interesting. Apparently, you're good at this, right? Like, make it, make it fun. Yeah, yeah. But I do feel that that advocates of of nuclear, which I'm, I'm hoping you have a lot of advocates who are listening. I feel like they need to hear what I had to say. So, I agree. Well, DJ, this has been fantastic. Why don't you leave us on a positive note? Where where are we going to be in 10, 20 years? Oh boy! Oh, we're gonna we're gonna be building a lot of nuclear. Like I I I I'm, I feel very confident about that. There's a lot of goals we're trying to make, and and we're there's a lot of goals to make a lot of nuclear, and which really excites me because I would not have said that maybe a year ago. You know, I would not have been as confident maybe a year and a half ago, but. I, do, I I'm feeling very confident in in where we're going, and I think it's my my confidence is getting increasing more and more as as time goes on. Awesome. Well, that's a great place to leave it, DJ. The clear. Thanks so much for coming on the Fire Division podcast. It's been a great chat. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we had, we had stopped recording, and then we started recording again, but we we forgot to mention this. So, DJ, you're you're fundraising for yourself, right? You're trying to make trying to make a point about how hysterical the world is being with this tritium release from for Japan. So why don't you give us kind of perspective on what this tritium release has been and then what you're trying to fundraise for? Yeah. So as as your viewers might might have already heard, but Japan recently has begun their discharge plan of the tritiated water from Fukushima. And this has stoked a lot of fear. I would say particular and and misinformation 
I say a particular that that misinformation mostly is coming from China, and they're putting out a lot of propaganda out there about it as well. Just because I think of of the, the Japanese Chinese that whole thing that's been going on for almost a hundred years now, or probably more than that. I I'm not not a historian, but I. I think a lot of people misunderstand what's going on there. Like I said, people don't understand radiation. And my plan, and I've had this plan for quite a while, and I finally put it out, I think, at just the right moment when Fukushima decided to do their discharge. I'm like, hey, I am going to go to Fukushima. I'm going to eat the food. I am going to eat the fish. I'm going to swim in the water that's next, as close as I can get to where they're discharging. I will swim in the water. And no, no, not only am, and I, am I going to do that, I'm going to bring my kids with me. I'm going to have them consume those same foods that I'm consuming, get as close as they can and swim in the water. And even, I, I'm not sure whether or not we can, but I would love to actually go into the exclusion zone as well and, and walk around and just show people that I, I really mean what I what I mean when it comes to the safety around Fukushima. And so I started to go fund me and it's on my my bio in TikTok. I should probably put it somewhere on on Twitter, but it's one of my tweets I put out a GoFundMe to support my trip to Fukushima to to do this because I again I'm not paid to to do this. So I need some help. What I think of Google GoFundMe. To, to yeah. Yeah. Let me. Google DJ LeClear and the rad guy came up on Twitter. So. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. it's. I think if you look on GoFundMe, it's like uh, send the rad guy to Fukushima. <laughs> yep. Go, it is. GoFundMe.com slash F slash send the rad guy to Fukushima. Cool. I'm going to make a donation right now. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> well, man, it's great chat. Absolutely.